1980, I died ice climbing in Western Canada in the Rocky Mountains in March with 10 feet of snow on the ground at night while ice climbing. We had just finished an eight day expedition backcountry skiing and snow caving in neighboring British Columbia. And the way we're going to, and we did spend one day ice climbing. I had never ice climbed before. Tim was a certified lead climber. We trusted each other. We learned that on our snow caving expedition. I'd climbed before other kinds of climbing. I'd been on ropes and cliffs and handholds and, and I'd climbed them with backpacks for weeks and even a month at a time. I knew better. That's really what that whole little part was about. I knew better than to climb with not the right gear. I had in my right hand a, a hammer with a little strap on the bottom that's primarily used to chip ice and put in screws, straps so you don't drop it, and an axe with a strap that you can set in the ice and then hang on and let, open your hand up. But with the hammer, you can't do that. And this was so short, my swing was short, my swing was long, my climb was slow slower than everyone else on the climb that day. And we weren't the only ones, there were other parties. By the time we were an hour or two from the top of the climb, 500, 600 feet, we both knew we were in trouble because of my slow climb. I had to rest and rest and rest because gripping the hammer was exhausting to my forearms. By the time we sat down on the ledge at the top of this five or 600 foot climb, I think I said, it was sunset and the temperature dropped. And we watched the other teams, the last of the other teams, walk out looking at us, waving to us. We watched them leave and wave to us and we knew that we were in deep trouble. And I'm gonna cut a long, traumatic story short of three repels and the last one was on which the one I died. But the harrowing night of trauma that made me dig a deep well inside myself, or rather I dug this well and at the bottom of this well, I found a drive for survival that I didn't know existed in me primarily. We suffered hypothermia all night long. It set in when we reached the top of the climb and violent shivers came and then frostbite came and then frozen feet came and brain freeze and eyeball freeze and jaw freeze and loss of coordination and reasoning. But there was always this drive and so we traversed, made mistakes. The warden came looking for us. We were heartened. And then when we reached the last, the top of the last rappel, he left because we were only 100, 150 feet up. One easy, it's the training rappel. It has the iron pins and the iron rings epoxied into the mountain with carabiners, twins, and straps and carabiners, and one that hooks to my harness and one that hooked to Tim's harness. And we were secure on a ledge for the first standing on a ledge, a wide I could turn and not hold and safe with a strap. But I came down second and I had the control of the rope. Tim always went first because that's the harder position. I came down second because it's the easier one. I came down, I tied the rope, one end of the rope called the bitter end to my harness, took the other bitter end of the rope and tossed it out to the side and gave a good yank on the rope to pull it down from the ring above through which we'd put it and on which it was hung. And we had repelled in this cornery crag full of shadows. And because it was a corner, I pulled on the rope. And as I did, it jammed somewhere up above, I don't know where. And the way it lay on the corner, meant I couldn't snap the line to lift it and free it from whatever snag caught it. It was jammed more tightly every pull. Our situation was desperate. And there came a point during this that I came to understand, I'm gonna die here. This is where I'm going to die. My body became hot. I unzipped my coat. I know better. Tim scolded me. I didn't care. I felt like I needed to preserve these organs here that I could lose a finger or a hand or a toe or a foot if these survive. But I was hot, so I unzipped my coat as if to let the heat be freed, irrational. I then realized it was done. I was done, it was over. And I, I remember standing and looking off, the Saskatchewan River was just below and we could hear it all night. And beyond it was a mountain full of snow illuminated by the 10 billion colored stars in the sky and the moon that had risen and given us some light. 
to see by as we tried to self-rescue. But then I remember thinking about my parents and the loss of my sister. She had run away as a child and it broke my family. I was in Montana to get away from the brokenness and I wasn't home on vacation visiting family. I was on a mountain cliff and they didn't even know where I was, but I knew where they were. And I remember thinking, I guess they're going to lose another child. And what kind of break will that give them? What kind of snapping will there be? And the whole family, nothing I could do about it. I accepted my position where I put myself and a peace overcame me. A relaxation, a recognition of reality and an acceptance of my sudden destiny. I began to fall asleep, smack my helmeted head on the rock and awaken, stand up and pull on the rope again. When I would fall asleep, I would black out and collapse from exhaustion, lack of hunger, pardon me, lack of food, lack of water, exhaustion, fear, trauma, all that. I'd wake up and I'd stand up and I'd pull on the rope and I don't know how many times that happened. It just happened until it stopped and I stood. And this time when I stood up, there was a black ring all around me, like a spotlight on a stage, I've said before, and coming down a tunnel vision. And as I moved, it moved with me and it went out. And I thought to myself before it extinguished, I must be falling asleep, but I didn't. It went to black and I stayed awake and all of my pain was gone. And I didn't understand where I was or what happened to me. I thought, I must still be on the mountain. It must still be in front of me. I, I was confused. And way far in the distant distance, in this immense darkness that was illuminated by the arrival of the light and still was an immense darkness, a light and a darkness, as the light came rushing toward me from a pinprick of a hundred billion light years away. I don't know. Too far to measure. All I speak here is metaphor. Metaphor because I have no words to talk about the place where there are no things. I had no brain, so there was no brain to carry language. There was a different kind of communication. And this entity came rushing toward me and said, time to go, you're coming with me, I'm taking you. And it communicated to that to me without language. And I put up this wall of resistance. I sort of stood all of my strength and pushed toward it and it just took me like I had no defense whatsoever and it pulled me out and I was inside of it and it was like an orb like an entity like an, a consciousness an intelligence a greatness all powerful and it was here and connected far far away and somehow they were in communication but it had its own entity and I was inside it like riding in a, a cushioned transparent energetic ball where I lost all agency. I lost all motion. I didn't care either. All of it was being poured into me. All of this entity was pouring into me this comfort and intelligence, this great intelligence, this great knowledge, this recognition of, I know this place. I know this feeling. And I am inside in some sort of similar astral body. I don't know what to call it. Had some sort of similarity to my physical body, but it, but the connection was cut. I was no longer attached. And I could see out of these eyes and I could see from a distance into the orb. I was both in it and outside it. And my outsideness had no substance to it. But inside I had some level of, I don't know how to describe it. It wasn't physicality at all. It was energy organized. And I was carried back to the point of the entrance where the light had come from. And all the while it was communicating to me and it popped me out. And I was an entity like itself, but smaller, but larger than I'd ever been. I was in a place of nothingness, but the nothingness was fullness. And it was dark as far as I could see. I knew myself. I recognized myself. This is me. This has always been me, I thought to myself. And my thinking was my seeing, was my language, which had no words because I had no brain and no physicality. I was an energy ball of consciousness, recognizing and remembering and recalling my true self, shed of my skin, shed of my ego, shed of myself. 
I found who I was. And I had no fear. I was in comfort land. I was in, hey, ah, home. And then this portal up opened, this waterfall of white, pure light and 10 billion times a trillion colors, like the stars I'd seen in the sky. So many colors in the stars up in the great north where there are no lights on a moonless night. So many colors and so many sizes, so dense a field of stars that you can see by it. More in this flow, this waterfall of colors than I saw in the night sky the night before. Times a million, maybe. And it was solid. And it was translucent and it was transparent and I could see into it and it was the most attractive desirous thing I'd ever seen in my life. I went to it and I could see as I looked into it a tunnel that led further in and I touched it with my consciousness, my energy all of self and it flowed into me. It flowed into me and it surrounded me and I recognized that this infinity was the body of the entirety of this same entity, only larger than I could imagine, larger than infinity, flowing into me with all these simultaneous experiences. There's light and there's self, there's illumination. I, I am seen for who I am. All of my human life is exposed not a part of me is not naked in the fullness of this light, no hiding places. So my life experience, my life review, the life experience that mattered was the were the wounds that I gave everyone in my life in a sequence from their interior point of view. Inside of them, the divine lived and felt and saw all of the emotions and responses that I had caused and brought me into that. Simultaneous to experiencing all of the emotional responses to all of the pain that I'd caused from the point of view of the, of the person I gave it to, times 10,000 it felt like to me. All of that pain that I'd given away, it actually clung to me. And I was not being judged. I was judging myself. The divine, meanwhile, in me, around me, showing me all of this, simultaneously showing me all of this, pouring love into my orb of self. And so I'm shown all of this while this love is pouring into me, showing me this while I'm simultaneously experiencing all the pain that I gave away in my life. And I judged myself guilty, not because of what I had done, but yes, because what I had done. I had hurt all these people, but not because of that, but because of the, the comparison of the divine light, which was infinite in size, all loving, all compassion, all kindness, pouring out. I love you. 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 I made you. I made you. I made you. I made you. You are my beloved. I know you. I've always known you. All these things that you've done to these people. I've known everything that you've done. I've lived inside of you. I've seen your life by being inside of you, which is how I saw inside the lives of those I hurt. And as I listened to this impouring inside of me of eternal love, it was like the ear of my heart began to hear it. And I could see all of humanity. I could see all of the brokenness of humanity from the worst of us to the best of us. There's this great equality of separation, of limitedness. And from our side, it looks so huge. But from where I was, it was non-existent in comparison to the light itself. There was this great equality of brokenness. And the divine love was so merciful, so loving, so forgiving, so welcoming, so healing, so fulfilling through the ear of my heart of all the love that I had given away in my life and all of the love that had been given to me in my life was like this treasure chest. And it was an ear through which I could hear the call and words of the divine who loved me as I was, as I lived, and as I turned all of that suffering that I underwent from all of the pain that I had given away, it just vanished in a wholeness of healing and expansion like a balloon inflated. Only what was breathed in was the divine self, joy, 
and bliss paradise healing wholeness understanding knowledge knowledge anything i wanted and i wanted i wanted to know how the whole universe worked and i was flash shown the complexity and simplicity of the entire thing all these things and so much more than my language can contain and this is always the problem with mysticism language can't contain it the same is true with rumi and kafir and jesus and feeling in Norwich, everyone, T.S. Eliot, and everyone has the same problem, phrasing, wording, the unphrasable and the unwordable. I then, from this unitive state where one more drop of the divine self, I felt like it was going to explode me, maybe bring me back into the oneness of being, which turned into my desire, seeing that it was possible, made it what I want. And I shrunk back down to some size like Peter, somehow was reconnected because I remembered my parents before I died. I guess I brought them across with me. Maybe that's what happened. Maybe because I didn't bring anything else with me. I brought my parents with me and my heart ached for their potential loss. And I presented this saying, am I dead? And the voice said, yes, you're dead. I said, I can't be dead now. The voice said, why come home? It's your time. Welcome. I said, because my parents had lost my sister, they were still grieving, she was still missing. And in that instant, I was swept across the universe. And in that instant, I was swept across heaven to the edge of the universe, where it was the beginning of matter, like a Higgs boson field of where energy becomes a thing. And I was thrust out, still my soul self, seeing the expanse of the universe and seeing all the galaxies and seeing the just the magnificence of all of the structural organization of it and the flow of it and it all reduced down very rapidly from all of that to one galaxy to our star system and in our star system i could see our planet and our planet was like a hologram and on the hologram were seven billion living people like this wasn't a movie of these people. It wasn't a recording of these people. I could see every 7 billion persons as they lived their lives on earth all at once in a particular time. And I, half the world was asleep. The other half was working, wars, babies, death, earth, horrors and beauties. And I could see inside every single one. I was shown inside every single one a golden light a golden fleck of light shining inside every human heart didn't matter who they were way down deep inside them and there was a foam that covered the whole earth and the foam was like a fog between the people and although they could see each other they couldn't see each other they couldn't see their the heart of gold it was obscured by the foam but i could see it because the divine lived inside them because the divine lived inside everything in the heaven I was in. And I could see the concentrate of goodness. And in seeing that, the voice expanded the size from single universe to multiverse, all these universes and all this time and all these universes. And it all came pouring in. They all spoke. They all spoke love. They all spoke to me. I was a beloved. I was the aim of universes of sizes of love. This love was all made me understand the largesse of myself. And the, the, the love is the center of all there is in creation. And I understood in the same moment that I was the prodigal child. I was the beloved one that every single golden flecked human being alive were made of the same love I was feeling, the same love that was pouring in to me was everywhere and in humans. And because of this love, all was, will, and is well, eternally, forever, from the beginning of the beginnings to never ending. And I saw my parents' faces and I could see these two tracks of their of parallel lives them living without me and them living with me and i could see the outcome and the outcome was the same because in the inpouring of this love that poured out from the universes of the multiverses 
of love was, is, and shall be, made it well. And I understood that no matter what I chose, my parents would be in the place of well-being. With me, like everybody, all are connected to this, them, the light. There is nothing that is that is not that. And well-being awaited my parents, no matter what I chose. But I saw their suffering in the lives if I died. I could see their breakage, and I could see less breakage. Still breakage, there's always breakage. The world is breakage, but they would never know the other parallel path, universe, their lives would have taken. The complexity of every decision that all these people make, these seven billion people, and how they, they understand their lives. My simple decision of choosing to request, let me go back, but it's your time to stay here, come home to us but I haven't gone fully into you. I still have this, I recognized that I had this somehow job to do. So I said, do I have to stay? And the voice said, no, you don't have to stay. I said, well, then I choose to live my life. And the voice said, you won't live your life and kicked me out. And as I flew, the voice stayed with me. And as I flew, I became more dense, less nothing, more things. And in front of me were 10, 100,000, a million doorways, countless doorways of tunnels that choose from among these lives. And in the center core of all of these openings, they were circular, was a single core of intense white light that made them all exist, that brought them all from the divine self into beingness. The voice said, pick, choose. I wanted some corporeality. I wanted to be able to live as a common, normal, broken, limited human being. I thought to myself, maybe if I live as a common, normal, broken human being, I can channel light and they'll see that it's not my light because they'll see like, well, he's kind of a normal guy. And they could see that it's the light itself. I wanted a little hedonism in my life. I wanted a little bit of fun in my life. I wanted creativity in my life. I wanted my desires. And it turned out that I've spent my whole life trying to lean into the place that I could have chosen when I was there. Back to the light itself. After death, there is light. There is love. After death begins before death. The training is here if you want to pursue it. But you don't need the training. You don't need to practice meditation, some form of selfless practice. You can just love the people in your life and treat them with kindness, treat them with humility and compassion, be strong, don't let yourself get hurt, but love and care, and especially for those in your care. That's spirituality enough, right there.